This is our code so far. We started to work with our JavaScript. We created an iffy. Basically, this is a, a better, more uh, efficient way to write our JavaScript. And we added the use strict directive so that the web browser is directed to uh, use a strict mode. We then wrote console log. We, we, uh, we use the log method of the console object. We did that last time, but now we can write a comment if you'd like. So uh, use the log method of the console object to give yourself a message in dev mode, dev panel. And as I said last time, JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language. If you check the book, it's got a better explanation than, than what I can do now, but it goes on to talk about how objects in programming languages are about representing real-world things in an abstract computer way. So it gives the example of a house. A house, you know, is an object in the real world, which has rooms. A room is a property of that object. We're going to work with properties of objects in JavaScript. Then we've got methods. It gave the example of a car. A car is an object in the real world. It has a property of 60 miles per hour. It has a property of red. But we can change the color of that object in JavaScript. Car color equals yellow. And it changes. And then we've got methods, which are sort of like action. So what kind of action can you do with a car in the real world? Start, decelerate. Start it, accelerate it, decelerate. You can do something with a car. So methods are things that you do with an object. Car object with a method to accelerate. And then the value of acceleration is, you know, 50 miles an hour or, you know, 50 meters per, meters per second, whatever. So here we've got an object. We've used the log method, and then the uh, value that we wrote there went to the console. I want to capture the text that someone would write inside of these input fields. And similar to last time, well, we need to create JavaScript objects that represent those HTML elements. What I want to do is when the person clicks Submit, I want JavaScript at that moment to check what did the person write. I don't want JavaScript to check what did the person write right now. I want JavaScript to check when the person clicks submit. Do you see the difference? Someone might have typed something, changed their mind, and then click submit. So at the moment we click submit will be the event, will be the trigger to check what did they write. So first, we need to actually reference that whole form. We need to go back and add an ID to the form. Just about anything in HTML, we can add a unique identifier as an ID, or later on we will also see classes. We have classes and IDs. Classes in JavaScript are very different than classes in C++. So if you know that knowledge, it's something else, classes. ID. We'll call this ID equals form user. Prefix, whatever prefix you want, so that I can quickly see in my code, oh, this is related to a form I created somewhere. So that later on I'll see, oh, in last, that's related to an input field I created somewhere. And then this could be in form username. You know, this is where your naming conventions, however you want to make these up, just be consistent. But if you're working in some sort of team, there's probably some sort of style guide that the team has that everyone should adhere to so that everyone's writing it the right way. I'm going to go with form user. I want to create an object in JavaScript that represents that form. We create objects with var, variable, l, form, user, equals something, create a JS object based on the HTML 
The very technical way is HTML node. There are nodes in the HTML elements. I'm going to create a JavaScript representation or a shorthand, a nickname for an object, an element, a node in the HTML area. L for element. I often see these also depending on the style of the programmer. I see them as O for object. Also, sometimes I see OBJ. Whatever these are going to be called, I just in my experience of these years now, I'm used to L, L form user, O form user. They're all right, they're all wrong. Just stick with a format. But this is something <coughs> we're inventing. So we're choosing to call it this capital F, capital U. L form user. They do. But since we're creating a brand new thing, this is different than L form user. But I'm using a capital F here because this style of the programming is the first the first word in the the first part of the word is lowercase and then subsequent parts are uppercase. Last time we saw this, document.getElement by ID. <laughs> JS naming conventions. No uppercase first letter. No number at the beginning. Use intercaps for readability. This is mentioned somewhere early on in the book, chapter 2. They give you a nice list that you can look at. Just advice. So I'm following the advice of the book, which is advice that I'd seen before. Just a way to, a way to, uh, so that everyone's on the same page. That we're all programming the same, so that we don't, so that we don't butt heads. Somewhere there is somewhere there's a page in there that recommends how to name your objects that you create. Var for variable. Create a JavaScript object variable. It's a variable, it's an object, it's a container. In the real world, this container at the moment holds water, but it can hold orange juice, cranberry juice, it can hold you know, carbonated water. This container can hold something. That's one way to think about a variable, an object. And this object, this variable, also has properties. Half full, 100% full, 0% full. So this equal here is an assignment operator. We are assigning something to something. Basically, take the thing on the right and assign it to the thing on the left. You should probably know what we're doing here. What am, how do I complete that? Or in quotes, form user. This is when that lowercase is still lowercase because the ID up at the top is lowercase, but now here that I'm creating the JavaScript version of it, uppercase. It is, for beginners, seeming to be inconsistent. This would work just fine, lowercase f, and you could keep it like that. But again, this style of programming in JavaScript is that the second or more word has intercaps, capitalization internally or inside of the word. This also has another name, intercaps. Does anyone know what it's also called? Snake, snake, caps. snake caps. caps. I haven't heard Sorry. of snake caps. Camel caps. Camel caps. Like a camel. Do you see it's got two humps, right? So intercaps, camel caps. It's just that you capitalize subsequent words after. There's the humps right there. See, there's the head of the camel and humps. So this uh, this represents an object. Uh, 
of that whole form. A couple of enters. Now we can use the short the shorthand. We can use the the the, the, the shortcut to ref to re represent or reference the HTML node dot add event listener. Same as before. L form user dot add event listener. This works exactly the same as last time in that we're waiting for we're listening for some sort of event. Once that event happens, do more things. Well, last time we used a click, but that was for a simple button. This time we have a more complex form, and this form has the action or the event of submit. So when anyone ever submits this form, either by clicking the submit button or pressing enter, something more happens. The more is right here. We created a function previously, which I didn't really explain what it was. I will today. Function save name. There's some sort of function, which I'll explain what that is in a moment, and it's called save name, and it has a purpose. It saves a name. So let me say down here, event, let's say on the event of a submit, submittal, run the function, fn save name. Last time we saw a click event. We have submit. We have other ones. We have on load. In the event that the project loads up, that it's in memory, do something. Do you ever go to a website, you leave the website, and then a pop-up follows you? Well, there's an event called unload. When you leave a website, you've unloaded it from memory, and then it gets triggered, event listener unload, and then you get get a pop-up. Fn nasty pop-up. So there's all of these events that exist. And right now we care about the submit event. Just like last time, we're going to back up and add the function definition before, because the order of the code does matter. JavaScript will be processed from top to bottom. If we were to then define what the function is afterward, it may or may not fully work depending on the browser. Again, the browser interpretations. We're trying to reference something that doesn't exist yet. So if we first define what is fn save name, then we can use it later. Console is defined, you know, when the web browser starts. Uh, we had uh, window.alert. <coughs> That's defined when the, when the browser loads. It's built into JavaScript. We are inventing our own thing here. We need to define it, so we should define it before we use it. Let's back up. Function fn save name parentheses curly braces. Find a function named fn save name. So we may use it later. Now I'm going to write a couple of notes here. I've been writing single line comments. Does anyone remember how to write the multi line comment in JavaScript? Exactly, forward slash star star slash or asterisk. So now that's a multi-line comment. Start the comment here and the comment here. I uh, moved it to the next line just for readability. You know, this is this works fine, but you have to remember to put the double slash every time. And it actually takes, you know, four bytes. One, two, three, four. This one takes, you know, this is six bytes right here. This is only four bytes. Watch those bytes. 
but here I can further say a function. is a collection of steps. That's the most basic way to say it. A function is a collection or a set of steps in order, right, top to bottom. So a function in a video game, I might have one called fn high score. So the fn high score is invoked or is run, and what it does is it checks the current score, it checks the score of the other player to determine who got a higher score. If you got a higher score now, it then runs the step of playing a sound, and it runs another step of displaying it on screen. So it's a sequence of steps, collection of steps, or commands. does not need a uh, terminating semicolon. So I didn't write a semicolon at the end of that line. I've been writing a semicolon at the end of every other line. It will work fine with it, but some, some error checkers will tell you superfluous semicolon. So you didn't need that extra semicolon there. Yes? Exactly. Technically, that is known as an anonymous function. So this is a non-named function, which is immediately invoked, so we don't actually, in this case, need it to name it. It's a function, we invented it, we created it, we ran it, we used it right away, which is to then run these next steps of code. So we have this special case of the immediately invoked function that is nameless. We will see other examples of anonymous functions, but we have named functions and we have anonymous functions, and I'll point out when to use which one. So any new function that uses create, is it create inside that anonymous Yes, the point of uh, using this is to define our scope. So if we were to create a function outside of that function, it might cause trouble because you have these different scopes. So if you keep it all in the one function, that helps to avoid those conflicts. So we got this function, we've named it, it's a series of steps. Last time we simply wrote something there. But this time it's going to be more steps, so I'm going to break those curly braces apart. So here is where you could accidentally delete that curly brace and it breaks your function. Make sure you've still got the opening and closing curly braces and you can confirm by clicking on one and its pair should appear. Sometimes what happens is when people lose track of these things, the, the, curly, the curly brace you know, the opening and closing goes elsewhere. That one doesn't go there. This is supposed to close here, but it's closing way down there. No, that one is supposed to close the one at the very top. Now if I click on that one, you know, it, it can't find its pair. It went down to script. So keep an eye out for that to help you find your pairs. There's the pair. Okay, so what we're trying to do in this function is a series of steps, but before we get too complex, console log start up fn save name. This is a comment in quotes. It's also known as a string. Output a string to the console for verification. This is optional. I'm going to use console log a lot in this class, simply as a way to test things. Am I on the right track? Is it doing what, it, what I think it's supposed to do? Because we could write the next 20 lines of code. Then when we run it, nothing works. 
and I have to go back, what did I do in those 19 lines that was wrong? It's a good idea to early on, especially if you're a beginner, check yourself, check your code with a console output when you expect something to happen. If it happens, then you move on. Save it and run it. Type whatever you want. Click the Submit button. Check your console. And we should get the message start of that function. It still won't do what we need it to do yet, but I want so no errors. Just type whatever for the moment. Click Go. We should get the pop up. We need one more thing actually, but this is this is what we should be doing because we want to be testing this stuff as we go on. If you don't see that output, don't worry. If we don't see that output just yet, that's that's okay. We've got one more thing to do, but this console here is often set up. We set it up for it to output to us. The problem that's going on here is this would have worked just fine, and this worked just fine when we did that simple button last time, because it was a simple button. Here we're dealing with a form, which is a little bit more complex. A form expects to capture the information and do something. It has a behavior. It has a behavior. So there's, there's a, there's a built-in behavior that we have to override, because usually a form Maybe it's on a web server, we're going to capture information, we're going to process it on the server. We don't have it on a server, we just have it on our computer. So there's this event that we need to override. We need to go back and rewrite this uh, event listener a little bit. We're trying to run the function of save name via the default behavior, but we actually need slightly different behavior because we're not running it on a server. So the code here, function, open close parentheses, open and close curly brace around the named function. This is the example here where we've got this anonymous function. This anonymous function, we're going to run we're going to run a function, this one, after we click. But the point here also is that we need to pass in a parameter. There was a question previously about passing parameters, which I, I didn't quite answer last time because we weren't there yet. But do you notice that we have log parentheses? We had alert parentheses. We made up functions save with parentheses. But a moment ago, we did not use the parentheses. There are times when we use the syntax of not using parentheses. And there's a time, there's a time when we do use the parentheses, and this is one of them. Because what we want to say is function event, and then inside of these parentheses, event. Capture the event uh, named event. We called it event. Uh, people uh, oftentimes also uh, simply call it E. You might see that as E. Maybe that is event just to spell it out. Capture the event named event so that we may override the default behavior of form submittal. This is again HTML, easy. CSS, a little less easy. JavaScript, hard. Or harder. Because the default behavior built into a form, basically, is that it's on a server, we submit it, the server processes it. We're not on a server. We have to then override what it expects. So we have to rewrite our code here. The event of trying to process it on the server, we're going to pass it into 
the function here so that we can say so that we can do it differently. This is event here. We're waiting for submittal. When someone clicks submit, an event happens. <coughs> Capture the event, pass it into, use it with function save name, pass it into, and then use it event dot prevent default. Event is actually technically an object. And then we're using the built-in method prevent default. So you should get the output now. The console. kind of wordy, it's kind of verbose, but again what we're doing here, we have to prevent the default. A moment ago it didn't work because the default behavior, technically it sort of reloaded the page. It was very subtle, but without that prevent default, we clicked go and the page refreshed. That was the default behavior. I don't want that because on the server, usually you submit something, the page refreshes, and then you see a result. Well, I don't want that default behavior, so I'm preventing that default behavior. In this case, pass in the event argument to prevent the default behavior. A refresh after submittal. behavior. So this is the example where with Notepad++ you can select the word and it should highlight elsewhere just to confirm with that anonymous function event, capture it to pass it into the named function event. We've defined that function to accept an event expect an event, passed it in, we use it in here, our first step is prevent the default, do the rest. Let's pause there. Does everyone get that message? Start. We're starting our function. If it's not quite there, check your spelling, raise your hand, anyone in the middle there? Thank you. 
So let's go on. That, uh, if you got an error, you might have seen that uh, spelling does matter. Uh, if you had a capital F in one place and a lowercase f in another, it's an error. Many programming languages do have case sensitivity. 
So if down here I created a function called fn, capital FN, save name, this is wrong. And if I save it and run it, it won't give me the best kind of error message oftentimes, unfortunately. And it didn't even give me an error until I try to submit it. So then it's going to pop up. So some errors appear right away and some don't. This one doesn't appear until I try to click submit. But other things that are misspelled might appear right away. This is saying reference error, F and say name is not defined. Of course it is, I wrote it right here. Oh no, lowercase. So that's different. Uppercase, lowercase is different. Mind the number that it's telling you, line 54, and check what's there, because some of these, sometimes these error messages are so, you know, so wordy that they don't really explain themselves what the error is. A few people said an error with your parentheses, but actually you misspelled something else. So unfortunately, even many of these error message consoles don't tell you exactly the problem, but they do help you hone in on the line number. So the point of what we did here is to simply say, start of save name. It's not capturing the name yet. It's not saying that name in the, in the console yet. We're not there yet. Right? If I type... John Smith and press enter. It's not going to say the name yet, and we're not there yet. And this is the this is that issue. This is when you realize computers are dumb because I have an idea of what I want it to do, and it's not doing it yet because I have to program it and tell it exactly what I want. We haven't said anything about capturing the name. All we've said is set ourselves up so that when someone clicks.